for one. Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown, Salem Radio Network's channel SR2, 90 seconds from Mark, 90 seconds. stations is now one minute before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown one minute from mark one minute stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown 30 seconds until hour number one from mark that was our final verbal time check for the line of fire with dr michael brown we'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before followed by a short one at five seconds have a great afternoon everybody We're going to have a spirited discussion today about an important pro-life bill. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the Line of Fire today. This is Michael Brown. Delighted to be with you. Our focus today, pro-life. We're going to be talking about some very important issues. Here's the number to call, the way in to ask your own questions, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. A couple months back, I had on the air Janet Porter. She is a conservative activist. She is a pro-life leader. And she's author of the new book, A Heartbeat Away. And uh, she has been called one of the five most dangerous religious right leaders in Trump's America because of her being a champion of the heartbeat bill, saying that once a heartbeat is detected, that you cannot abort a baby. Uh, After Janet was on doing the show with me, a gentleman called in and he raised concerns about the bill. And he said, actually, the bill itself accepts abortion to a certain point, but then tries to outlaw it beyond there. And I said, well, isn't this just incremental progress? In other words, every abortion we could stop is a step in the right direction while you look for the complete abolition of abortion in in a culture that becomes a pro-life culture. And he said, no, 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 the very wording of it itself is defective. And he recommended I have some other folks on to present their viewpoint. So we reached out to Tom Heffling. And I'll introduce Tom in a moment to you. Uh, Tom immediately said he'd be happy to come on. Janet said she'd be happy to come back on and interact with Tom. Now, at this point, we are having a problem reaching Janet, so we may hear from only Tom today. Hopefully, we'll be able to find out where she is. And sometimes people get time zones wrong or there's a mix-up, something. But Tom is a national conservative political activist. He's a publisher, organizer, and consultant. Uh, He worked uh, closely with um, former Reagan administration official and U.N. ambassador Dr. Alan Keyes. Uh, Many of you will remember Dr. Keyes running for Congress, running against someone named Barack Obama, if I recall. Uh, Tom's the primary author of the Equal Protection for Posterity Resolution, which we'll talk about. So hopefully we'll have Tom and Janet interacting, but we're going to start with Tom for sure. Uh, Tom, welcome to the Line of Fire. Thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Dr. Brown. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me ask first, before we get into any specifics, why you are so passionate about pro-life issues, why it's been such a, a major burden to you for so many years. Well, of course, you know, that starts with my Christian faith. I mean, 
I, I can read my Bible, and it says, "Thou shalt not murder." That's pretty pretty clear. Uh, I I'm a father of ten. I have four grandchildren so far. You know, I love children. I, I also love my country, and uh, our our Constitution states as its ultimate purpose to secure the blessings of liberty to our posterity. So. I, many years ago, I reached the conclusion that if you want to save America, you must stop this genocide that we call abortion, uh, because abortion violates, it, it destroys every stated purpose of our Constitution. It, it uh, is contrary to God's law, it's contrary to the natural law, contrary to the explicit equal protection and due process requirements of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments, as well as as well as the equal protection requirements of all of our state constitutions. Right. So it's it's both a, a moral issue as well as a constitutional issue and an issue, obviously, that every American of conscience should be concerned about. Uh, we have Janet on the line. We've introduced Janet already. Uh, Janet, thanks so much for coming back on with us today. Thank you. So glad to be here. All right. So, Janet, uh, what I want you to do is just take a, a couple of minutes and lay out why you feel the heartbeat bill is, is so important and is making so much progress in America. And then we'll go back to Tom to see what objections and issues he has. And we'll, we'll have a dialogue, uh, all of us being passionate pro-lifers, but with some major differences here. So why do you feel that the heartbeat bill is, is so essential, so, so important? Essential. Sure. Um First off, let me say that, that I think we all share the same heart, that we want to protect babies from when their lives begin at the moment of conception. And I've spent more than 40 years in the movement trying to do just that. Um, I started off in the, in the Right to Life movement where their strategy was really one of incrementalism, where they were really moving uh, like a millimeter down the field uh, as we were trying to, to restore protection. And, and I just remember saying, listen, we, we got to do better than this. And I was a part of the South Dakota effort, and they uh, were looking to restore legal protection from conception and had radio stations uh, in, I think it was seven different cities in South, South Dakota every day, uh, as well as my regular show that we were there, uh, out there on the ground, doing everything we can and everything we could. Um, but there came a point, and it was in 2010, where the idea uh, came to me again. Um, it was actually an idea I had about 30 years ago, and some folks in the pro-life movement said, listen, we can't rescue every child just yet. Let's get as many as we can. And I proposed the idea of a heartbeat bill, and I'll, I'll just tell you, I was, I was beaten down and bloody uh, to the place where it was any time that you suggested we do anything other than move a millimeter down the field that, that it was, you know, couldn't be done. And, and who was I to question their well-thought-out legislative strategy? After all, I was a kid out of college with a lot to learn. But what I learned is that the strategy that we had been using has been uh, giving us an, over a million dead babies every single year, uh, and a body count of 62 million. And so I decided, well, I'm going to try and do more, and that's why we tried the personhood. We tried to, you know, to, to restore legal protection from, from conception. Um, but we hadn't been successful. Back in 2010, Alabama had not yet passed that bill. Um, and I said, listen, people are only interested in an in, in, in incremental bill. Well, let's give them a great big increment. And then that's where we said let's use the scientific indicator that science has given us in every other area, uh, in, in every other uh, uh, hospital in the world. You look to see if there's a heartbeat to determine whether or not there's life. And so the bill simply says if a heartbeat's detected, the baby's protected, and it will protect every child whose heartbeat can be heard and as technology increases will protect more and more. And so we introduced that heartbeat bill back in 2010, um, and there were a lot of people who told me it was absolutely impossible, couldn't be done. Um, but now, the impossible is now inevitable because we've seen heartbeat bills passed in Arkansas, North Dakota, Iowa, Mississippi, Kentucky, Georgia, Missouri, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Ohio, where it all began, so that instead of abortion stopping a beating heart, a beating heart will stop abortion, which is not to say we don't care about the rest of the babies because we certainly do. But it's, it's like standing outside a burning building. And, you know, there's some in the movement that would say, well, the right to life movement might say, well, we can only rescue those babies, those, those children in the parking lot. Uh, let's get those because we're 100 percent sure we'll get them. Well, that, that's, that's one approach. There's another approach that says 
I'm going to go in and I'm going to carry out as many children from the daycare center that's on fire. I'm going to carry out as many children as I can, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to get the rest. And that's that's really my position. Um, but then there's a purist position, which which I I think um, our guests might adhere to, and that is that if we can't get them all, if we can't get 100% of the children in our very first try, then let's just stand on the corner and watch the building burn and say we we'd rather be purists. We'd rather be be certain. Uh, to get them all in one trip, uh, and 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 the, the the sad fact of the matter is that approach has has saved you know virtually no one, with the exception of Alabama, the only state that's pulled it off at last year. Um, there's been no success in that effort. Even the, the small increments, at least those parental consents and right to knows and those those mamby pamby bills that I was a part of passing, at least they have protected uh, thousands of babies because. Um, when a woman is informed of, of that and when there's a 24-hour consideration waiting period or parental consent or parental notice, that, that, does, that does save lives. So I think that what my position is if you, if you want to support an incremental bill of 1% of the babies who, for example, feel pain, um, I'm for that. If you are for a personhood and you want to protect them all in one shot, I say go for it. Um, but, but the position that I take is, is, is I want to save as many as I can. Um, and, and that's exactly what the heartbeat bill is doing, and it's using science. And what I found is, and we, we found this in the legislature, both in the states and in Congress. Uh, I'll tell you one story. We, we brought in what we billed as the youngest to ever testify. We did it in the states. We did it also in Congress. We brought in an unborn baby at 18 weeks via ultrasound. And we put the ultrasound up on the screen, and we played little baby Lincoln, a little unborn baby boy named Lincoln. His, he, his face and his heart was beating up on the screen, and there were people who were there in the committee hearing. There were protesters who had been really rather disruptive. But when that baby's heartbeat was seen and heard in that Judiciary Committee in Congress, the room was silent. And one of the protesters who had been previously uh, very disruptive earlier was seen wiping tears from her eyes. And that's when I realized that this baby's heartbeat can reach the hardest of hearts and it can reach America, and that's what the heartbeat bill is doing. All right, Janet, thanks for laying that out so eloquently and passionately. Uh, Tom, I'm going to turn things over to you to, to interact. We're going to have a break that comes up, so you'll be able to get started, and then right after the break, back to you. So, so Tom, what are your thoughts? Well, I want to start by saying hi to Janet. We uh, know each other. It's probably been about a dozen years or more since we've seen each other. Uh, back in the days when I was working with Dr. Tees, and I think the last place we probably saw each other was down in Florida at a big event that Janet was putting on for the presidential candidate. Now, since that time, her and I have diverged in our paths. As she explained, she has become the primary uh, progenitor of the heartbeat approach, uh, the incrementalist approach, as she called it. Uh, I took another path. I, I don't even really call myself pro-life anymore. I call myself an abolitionist of abortion. She can choose to call it the purest position, but I call it the equal protection for all position. Uh, the problem with the burning building analogy that she used is that the incrementalist approach, the regulationist approach, which has been used now for decades by the pro-life uh, group and pro-life legislators, is that the bills themselves are intrinsically uh, immoral and unconstitutional in and of themselves. Before you even start to talk about the court, uh, the bills give permission to abort babies. Uh, this violates God's law. This violates thou shalt not murder. It also violates every uh, principle of our Constitution. It violates the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments. Uh, due process and equal protection clauses. All right, Tom, uh, I'm, I'm just jumping in. I know you're just getting started. As soon as we come back after a very short break, I'm turning the mic over to Tom Heffling to explain why he, as an abolitionist, has an issue with the heartbeat bill. And then we're going to have some very healthy interaction between two pro-life champions here. We'll be right back. So how did the fall affect humanity? Well, profoundly, deeply, in every way. We went from fellowship with God to separation from God. We went from spiritual life to spiritual death. We went from the potential of living forever 
to now having bodies that will decay and die. We went from trust to fear. It goes on and on. Everything negative that we see in the human race today, murder and rape and war, everything that we see in terms of people butchering each other, in, in terms of hatred, in terms of bitterness, in terms of lust, in terms of greed, in terms of every wrong thing that's in the human race, all of that happened because of the fall. Look at what Paul wrote, Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, he says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So every human being is born with a death sentence hanging over them. Every human, is, human being is born fallen, meaning that it is our nature to sin. Every human being is born as an object of wrath. Uh, ultimately, this is what we grow up to and become because this is in our very nature. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a child to lie, to disobey. This is part of our fallen human nature. So physical death is an outgrowth of it. Sickness, pain, disease, what we have in this world, all the sin of the world, and then spiritual separation from God, being in a spiritually dead state. That's what happened because of the fall. The good news is through the one man, Jesus, we can be forgiven, receive eternal life, and have more through Jesus on the other side of the cross than Adam and Eve had before the fall. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Friends, we're focusing on critically important pro-life issues today on the line of fire. This is Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us. If you have a question for our guests, I may take some calls today, but I want to give them every minute I can. 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. Speaking with pro-life leader Janet Porter, her book on the subject we're talking about, A Heartbeat Away, the importance of the current heartbeat bill that is going across America. My other guest, Tom Heffling, Another longtime pro life leader, but prefers to be identified now as an abolitionist of abortion. And he is the author of the Equal Protection for Posterity Resolution. So, Tom, you were saying before the break that, in your view, the idea that we'll go in and save as many babies as we can from a Bernie building and then do our best to go back and get the rest is immoral in itself, using that analogy, because you're saying that the very bills that we are discussing are actually saying it's okay to let the babies burn or that's part of the law. So it, if you could expand on that in terms of what exactly well, you find immoral in it and then go from there. Well, in fact, in two ways, uh, these bills leave all of the doors padlocked and, and, and chained shut. Because first of all, Every regulation of the bill is done within the context of the fallacy of judicial supremacy, that we have to conform our legislation and our public policies to what some court said 47 years ago. And that's simply not true. That, that is not the sort of government that the framers of our Constitution gave us. They gave us a constitutional republic in which we're supposed to have checks and balances. Uh, so since these bills intrinsically sacrifice the only real moral, constitutional, and legal arguments against abortion, which are, in the first place, equal protection under the law. Secondly, equal protection under the law for our God-given unalienable rights, starting with the right to life. So those principles, which you can't win this in any way, shape, or form, either within the context of the court or outside the context of the court, are thrown away every time we pass a bill that in effect ends with, and then you can kill the baby. If uh, under a heartbeat bill, all you've done is shorten the period. It's the same as a pain-capable bill, uh, 20 weeks, 6 weeks, whatever week. Most abortions take place long before that. Abortive patient drugs take place long before that. Most babies are killed, exterminated long before that. And, and by by passing legislation that continues to do that, you're making sure no babies are getting out of the, out of the uh, burning building. Uh, the babies who have died in the last four years, 
it made no difference to them whether Donald Trump was in office or whether Hillary Clinton was. Uh, we're, they're pursuing the abortion status quo. The next four years, it won't matter to those millions of babies who are about to be killed, whether Donald Trump or whether Joe Biden are in office. It won't matter one bit. All right, uh, Janet, back to you for your response <laughs> to Tom. Oh, my. I could not disagree more. Uh, what, what my friend here is saying is that, well, you know, it doesn't matter to babies whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden. Um, it absolutely does. Because whether we agree that the Supreme Court has the authority um, that they do, uh, the fact of the matter is they've taken it. And the way to get it back uh, is within our grasp right now. We've got a president, President Donald Trump, who has appointed Amy Coney Barrett, who is one who, who believes, as we do, that we should interpret the Constitution and not legislate from the bench as they have been doing. But look, <laughs> here's the bottom line. You could throw up your hands and say nothing matters, and if we don't get it perfect, nothing will happen. Look. I, I want to I want to end abortion. I want to quit talking about it. I want to quit marching about it. I want to quit debating it. What I want to do is end it. And what Dr. Wilkie, the founder of National Right to Life, said, he actually left the Ohio Right to Life affiliate of National Right to Life, the group that he founded, to join our effort. Because what he said was was what Tom and I would agree on. The incremental, uh, the incremental method has left us woefully inadequate. It didn't get us far enough, fast enough, Dr. Wilkie said. But what he also said is that he believes the heartbeat bill will protect, he said, that up to 95 percent of the babies. All right, let's just think about that for a second. If we protect almost every child facing an abortion, what that means is the abortion mills that are motivated by money are probably not going to stay open for a fraction of their business because they can't afford it. We're going to close them down. And that's what the pro abort said when they came in and testified is that this will end all abortions. And I sat there saying, yep, that's the plan. Because what this does is say, look, we may not agree that the courts have been legislating from the bench. We don't, I don't agree with it either, but we are where we are. And what we've done in a heartbeat bill, it doesn't say we can kill babies except for this. What it says is that if the heartbeat's detected, that baby's protected, and what the message we're sending to the court is one that the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals picked up on. When they reviewed the heartbeat bills, the heartbeat laws in Arkansas and North Dakota, they, they said, listen, and in response to what the Supreme Court has said, the Supreme Court has basically said, hey, state, you're allowed to protect children if there's a likelihood of survival to live birth. All right? But the marker they're currently using is a thing called viability, whether you can survive outside the womb. And it's done with a with an abortionist uh, does a measurement. He takes a measurement and he takes a guess. It could be as much as 90 percent wrong. But the Eighth Circuit recognized, hold on a second, we got a scientific marker here that is, is being applied everywhere else in our entire medical field. And they said that Arkansas and North Dakota's heartbeat laws, said the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, begging the Supreme Court to take up the case, they said, hey, they've got a more, quote, certain and consistent marker than viability, the lousy standard you're currently using. So what this does with this arrow that has been finally crafted to be the arrow that is launched through the court system to deliver the fatal blow to the heart of Roe versus Wade, we say move the protectability line from viability, which is miles away, all the way down to heartbeat, which is inches away from our goal. All right, and, and, and when Janet, we and, inches away. Yeah, let, let me just ask this: when when you're speaking of heartbeat being detected, roughly what week of pregnancy are you talking about? Right now, with our technology the way it is, if you use an internal uh, uh, ultrasound, you're looking at about six, seven weeks. All right, and you all said right? that's ninety five percent of abortions are performed. After that time, well, it could be it could be earlier than that. I don't really publicize that, but I'm just I'm quoting Dr. Wilson. Right, That's so what so, so six weeks, and you're saying uh, the vast majority of, of abortions are are then performed uh, after that time. Uh, Tom, you had said that the vast majority of abortions would not be affected by this, but if if heartbeat is detected at six weeks, uh, there's no. It's just, simply inaccurate that 95 percent of abortions take place after six weeks that's just not even well what, what, would, you, what would you say the stat is I, you know it's probably the other way around or closer to that much closer to that so but, you're, you're, just but, to be clear so you're saying that 95 percent of abortions take place before six weeks we don't look only god knows the true number we are now we have with ivf they're destroying millions uh with uh, abortifacient drugs, they're destroying millions, and those are certainly taking place mostly before six weeks. 
Uh, we have hormonal birth control, which just, uh, deprives uh, already created little babies from uh, surviving because it prevents them from implanting in the mother's womb. Uh, and, you know, so only God knows the real number. I don't really want to spend. But let me ask you something, really Tom. Let's just say number. let's just say it saved half the babies that are being aborted. Isn't that a worthwhile thing to do? So. This, is, this is not a numbers game, Janet. Look, uh, if it saves person, one life, I say do it. It doesn't, though. It doesn't. It, it can't because it sacrifices the only principles that argue against abortion on demand. And therefore, it keeps abortion on demand going. Look, incrementally. I disagree, and I'll tell you why. This already has well, saved lives. Uh, I know for a fact. There was a woman who, who brought, came up to me. Uh, she heard about the heartbeat because of, the, of just the publicity of uh, bringing in the ultrasounds there in the Ohio hearing room in the state house there. And she said that she, her friend asked her to drive her to the abortion mill because, because she, she wanted to hit an abortion. And she said, I couldn't do it. Once I found out about the baby's heartbeat, I couldn't do it. And months later, she showed me the picture of this little boy named Aiden and said he is alive today because of the heartbeat bill. And that was before it even passed the committee. We know this is saving lives. Senator Jason Raper from Arkansas told me about little baby Duncan was saved because the mother found out about the baby's heart because of an informed consent provision that was not struck down while the protection was. And so we know this is already saving lives for certain. All right, Janet, yeah, back to you, okay. Tom. Okay, look, detectable heartbeats is not the scriptural standard for protection, okay? And it's not the constitutional. It's nowhere in the Constitution. That is not the standard. You're talking about a human-made instrument that is not even capable on its best day of detecting human uh, heart functioning uh, from its earliest point of creation, which is that is creation. Uh, why do you think the abortionists want to harvest heart cells out of little babies? It's because they are hearts, whether you can detect them. And, and the heartbeat bills, all they do is give the, the executioner uh, the power to determine whether or not there is a heartbeat. Uh, why would you trust them? And why would you trust an instrument that can't even detect the activity of the human heart from its earliest functioning? Beating is not the criteria. Our criteria is, are they a human being made in the image and likeness of God? Are they? Are they a person, as per the 14th Amendment? Gorsuch says no, okay? Uh, Kavanaugh says, oh, precedent upon precedent. I'm going to follow precedent. Amy Coney Barrett says, I'm going to follow precedent. I am obligated to court precedent instead of to morality, instead of to, to the equal protection requirements of our Constitution. So, okay, Amy, first off, Amy, Amy said she would actually overturn precedents that, that uh, need to be overturned. She said she wouldn't do it in every case, but she's not adverse to, uh, to reviewing precedents, and I think that's an important point. But let me say this. Well, tell, we tell all what, know hey, the hard- hey, hold on to your thought, if you don't mind. we got a break. When we come back, we we'll just let Janet and Tom go back and forth. And, and I want to hear from Tom, okay, what's the strategy? How do we abolish abortion? And then from Janet, what's the significance of Amy Coney Barrett coming in? Stay right here. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, yes, of course. The, the biblical text is quite explicit that God did that. But is that the whole story? Did Pharaoh also harden his heart? Did God confirm Pharaoh in his hardness before further hardening and stiffening his heart? What does the Hebrew say? What's the chronology? Well, let's take a look in Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. God speaking to Moses, and there we read, The Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. You say, well, there it tells us flat out, God will harden his heart so we won't let the people go. Okay, if we go back to the third chapter, I'm looking at verse 19, look it up. You see that God tells Moses, this is the third chapter, so before what we just read, God tells him, I'm sure that the king of Egypt, I'm sure that Pharaoh will not let you go. Then start reading through the account and you'll see one time, two times, three times, four times, 
over and over, and Pharaoh hardens his heart, Pharaoh hardens his heart, Pharaoh hardens his heart, Pharaoh hardens his heart. In other words, his will, his sin, his evil, his stubbornness, this is the very reason that God raised up a wicked man to be in that position at that time. All right, he didn't raise up a God-fearing man and then harden his heart and turn him away. He didn't raise up a humble man looking to the Lord for help and then harden his heart and turn him away. Rather, he raised up a wicked man with a wicked heart. And Pharaoh over and again says, no, 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 no. His pride, his rebellion, no, no, no. Then the first thing it says is that God strengthens his heart. That's the first Hebrew word that's used for harden. Okay, it is literally to strengthen. So God now, as Pharaoh's reaping what he sows and God's bringing judgment on him, he's strengthening him in his own sinful resolve. And, and, and then the next one is making his heart heavy uh, in that sense. And then the last one, he's making it harsh or hard. In other words, there is a progression as Pharaoh sins, as Pharaoh hardens his heart, as Pharaoh says no to God, God says, all right, I'm going to confirm you in your sin. You are sinning, you're rebelling. I'm going to confirm you in your sin rebellion. I'm going to make your heart even harder. I'm going to make it now so this is your resolve to sin. I am backing your resolve to sin. And so, again, it's not God taking someone and saying, God, help me. God, I need help. I have mercy. I want to do the right thing, but I need help. And God says, "Uh uh-uh, I'm going to harden you. Rather, God is, yes, he does harden. He does stiffen. He does do this to Pharaoh's heart. But number one, Pharaoh does it first. God says first that Pharaoh will do it. And number two, it is progressive, a strengthening of Hebrew in terms of what happens. This is the result of sin. And God did what was right. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Hey, friends. Having a spirited discussion today with two pro-life leaders, both passionate to save the lives of babies in America. Tom Heffling, longtime pro-life leader, 2015 listed by Newsmax as one of America's 100 most influential pro-life advocates. And he is the author of The Equal protection for posterity resolution. Janet Porter, who called one of the five most dangerous religious right leaders in Trump's America, is the author and champion of The Heartbeat Bill, her book on the subject, A Heartbeat Away. Janet says with this bill, not only can we save many, many lives of babies, but this will ultimately lead to the abolition of abortion in America. Tom says that this approach is immoral in itself in that it accepts the fact that babies can be killed up to a certain point. So we're right in the midst of this discussion. And right before the break, uh, Tom had made the comment that Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and now Amy Coney Barrett would accept the precedent of Roe v. Wade. And Janet, you were responding to that before the break. So back to you, Janet. Well, there were there were actually a few things I wanted to respond to, and, yeah. and that is is this. Um, we we've got we've got. By the way, if you read the heartbeat law, and I encourage people to go to faith the number two action dot org or f two a dot org, you can download and take a look at the model of the bill, and see that we've actually got some safeguards in there. That if the abortionist doesn't do what he's required to do, we get legal remedy. For example, if the woman's not informed, she's got legal standing to go in and uh, and pursue that legally. If, if they're performing abortions and saying, oh, we've got all these babies and we couldn't hear their heartbeat because, well, we were listening from across the room. Guess what? They're not following the standard medical procedure, and, and we're going to close them down. If they violate the law, they're a felon, and when they're a felon, they lose their medical license. That's the bottom line. But I think, I think that uh, the, one of the legislators in Georgia that passed the heartbeat law there said it very well. There was a bill, Ginny Earnhardt uh, did an uh, a, a, a op-ed piece. And she explained it, I think, very well, and it said that because the bill in Georgia wasn't perfect, there were those of the, of the purist movement from the right to life movement that actually um, – and here's what, here's, here's what she said. She says what happened in the heartbeat bill, Georgia right to life, which is the, is the uh, abolitionist arm of the, uh, of, the, of the movement, said by its own its – own, uh, boy, this is a little harsh – but it says by its own hypocrisy, told the Georgia legislature to cut the baby in half. In other words, like Solomon told the uh, the two women, you know what? You can you can have the baby, uh, or else we'll just cut it in half. 
well, if you're if you're a true person who wants to see that baby live, if you're a real mother, you're going to say, I'd rather have that baby live and be raised by someone else than be killed brutally by abortion. I think that's where we are. We're in a place where we have the ability to protect so many lives, nearly every child facing abortion or a whole bunch of them. Um, we have the ability to do that right now, and that's exactly what we've been doing. For the last 10 years, we passed 10 heartbeat bills. As we've mentioned, 29 are in the, in the queue ready to go. And I believe that when that gets to the Supreme Court, much like the Eighth Circuit said, hey, we've got a better marker. Move it from miles away from viability to heartbeat, which is inches away, in which case we protect nearly every child and make it far easier to go back and get the rest. But I'm not holding back Tom or anybody else from any other method that they think is great. And so instead of throwing rocks at the people you disagree with, you know what? I don't think the incremental, the, the right to life millimeter approach is a good one. But you know what? I'm not throwing rocks at them. And I'm not standing in their way because what they do, they may, they may protect some babies. They may educate some people about the truth. But, you know, I say to you, Tom, go for it. If you think you've got a better approach, then just do it. We're not stopping you. But, but quit throwing uh, Janet, rocks at people that are actually passing Janet, laws to protect human life. Go ahead, Tom. Janet, you, you need to tell the rest of the pro-life movement that because, in fact, we have had abolition bills in numerous states, including my own, seven years ago. A perfectly pure uh, declared abortion as murder bill scrubbed every bit of permission out of our code uh, to kill babies. And uh, it was blocked by the pro-life leaders in the Republican Party. And it last. By year, the way, I want to say it wasn't blocked by me. I support those. I, I supported them publicly. I've testified publicly for them. And it's wrong. Because hey, that's what I faced in Ohio when Right to Life testified right next to Planned Parenthood but, against the bill that would protect more babies than any other bill that's ever passed. Okay, but, yeah, go ahead, to, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Well, here's the problem. And I, I want to get in a minute to, you know, to, you asked before the break, you know, what's your plan? And, and I, I yeah. have one. But before I say that, look, in Roe itself, Sarah Weddington, the lead attorney for Roe, okay, uh, said, you know, in our state, in Texas, the offense is not murder. Uh, it's an abortion, which carries a significantly less offense. Uh, Harry, Harry Blackman's infamous footnote 54 in Roe v. Wade, he spelled out the reason why they were ruling on Roe the way that they did, and it was because Texas did not treat the unborn baby like any other person in terms of their laws and punishing, killing them. So, look, if we if we incrementally pass these bills, the best thing we are doing and the best thing we're doing in the courts is going right back to where we started with Roe. It, it was bad legislating that led to Roe in the first place. Uh, so. It, well, Tom, Tom let, we, uh, let, me, let me just ask this, and then I want to get to your plan, and, and obviously we'll, we'll keep going back and forth as much time as we have here. Um, if, if these heartbeat bills can then be the thing that gets up to the Supreme Court, you know, they're, they're protested, appealed, whatever, challenged, it gets up to the Supreme Court— if that could pave the way for the overthrowing, overturning of Roe v. Wade. But it can't. Okay, go ahead. Please it, it, tell us why. It can't, Doctor. It can't, Dr. Brown. And, and it can't for the very simple reason that it doesn't even address Roe in the first place. It, uh, the, main, the main issue in Roe is, is the child a person or not? Okay? A heartbeat bill says, no, they're not. Uh, I, I read my Iowa heartbeat bill. I read every single one of these bills. There's no punishment on the woman. That was what the Roe court hung their hat on. The woman doesn't even be the, the, the one who hires the hitman doesn't even get any punishment. And really, the the hitman only receives a slap on the wrist. So you're just the May best I you're going to get. The best you're going to get out of this is to start this whole bloody process all over again. Let, let me just quickly lay out. You, you asked me what's my point, okay? Yeah, so, yeah so Tom, one second. You'll do that, and then, Janet, I want to get back to you on the okay. question of could this, if the if heartbeat bill is challenged and it gets to the Supreme Court, could that lead to the overturning of Roe v. Wade? So we will get back to that. But, Tom, go ahead. Lay out your practical strategy. Well, it's very simple. You pass legislation that meets the equal protection requirement. Protect every So person. do it. Not, uh, we tried, and we are trying, and we're continuing to try. Uh, and, and one of these days we'll succeed when the, the 
Pro-Life Incorporated stops blocking the way. So, so, you, so, you, so pass, Tom, just to be clear, you, you feel that your biggest opposition that's hindering you from getting the bills through is from our own side, or is that just oh, part it, of the problem? There's, there's not even any question about that. Absolutely. So in other words, you feel so, that, uh, that legislators in different states would be willing to pass these bills, which which to many Americans would be radical, not, but obviously the goal that we all share. You feel that they would be no, willing to do it if but, the pro-life movement wasn't standing in the in the way? We we have had I think about eight states we've had bills. The only state we got a hearing out of the pro life Republicans is Texas last year. We had over five hundred Christian people there testifying on behalf of this good abolition bill. There were only five people who testified against it. The committee claimed to be heavily pro life. Guess what? They didn't let it even move one inch out of that committee. So the, the, the answer I, I tend to agree. Not. I agree that, that the enemy that we're facing, and I have a whole chapter in my book, and Tom, I really think you'd enjoy my book. Give me your address. I'll send you one. It's called The Enemy Within. Um, the, they are the ones that are blocking pro-life bills, including heartbeat bills, and including, as you've described. Um, but, but here's the deal. Um, what we've got to do, we can expose the, the, the evil within, and, and I think we need to do that. Um, but but I, I think that if, if, if you say your, your, your strategy is the way to go, I say, do it. Show me where you're doing it, and I'll join you. But in, until then, we've got a bill that are passing in state after state after state, and let me tell you why I believe it's going to be upheld by the Supreme Court. There was another bill that I know you disagreed with. It was a bill that, that I was fortunate enough to pass. The, the, first, the first one was a ban on partial birth abortion. All right, It educated a lot of people, didn't protect a lot of babies, but it did something that we, we didn't anticipate. It went up to the Supreme Court, and in Gonzalez v. Carhartt, what it, what they did, they've got an undisputed finding of fact, and I'm not sure you, you've heard of this. It's in my book as well. And the undisputed finding of fact that they found out in that partial birth abortion Supreme Court case, they said that there is a living fetus. Fetus is just the Latin word, which means young one, developing human, unborn child. There is a living child from the point, are you ready? The Supreme Court said in Gonzalez v. Carhartt, a living child, from the point of detectable heartbeat. It was not disputed by the pro abort. Everyone agreed on this. So now we've actually got a wedge in the wall of Roe versus Wade. We've got a way to kick this thing down because they've admitted, and the, it, it's now a, a, a legal precedent, that if you've got a detectable heartbeat in an unborn child, that child is a living fetus. By the way, medically speaking, if you've got a heartbeat in an unborn baby, which, as we know, uh, is, is, uh, it, it actually occurs between 18 and 21 days before the mother even knows that she's pregnant. But if you can detect it at any point, that child has a 95 to 98 percent likelihood of survival to live birth, which is precisely the, 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 the parameters that the Supreme Court said we're allowed to protect them. Now, I don't agree with judicial legislating but from the bench, but we, we are where we are, and we deal with the hand we've been given. And what we've been given is a way to, 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 to pierce the heart of Roe with medical science. You know, when those who, who fought me and, and said, oh, Janet's bringing in ultrasounds in the hearing room and her gimmicks and her stunts, they, they put the camera on me, and I said, isn't it sad that to defend your position, you have to deny science? You've got to run from technology. That's a sad place to be. I don't oppose your strategy. I'm with your strategy. But the problem is it hasn't worked yet. And until then, I'm going to try everything I can to rescue as many kids as I can, and then I'm going to go back and I'm going to get more. And then I'm going to get more until we, we stop the killing. And I, what I would propose to you, Tom, is the way to stop the killing is, is not so much to throw rocks at people that are on your team that, 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 that side with you, that want full protection for babies. We can expose that or those that are blocking your kinds of bills, but, but I'm not one of them. But what we want to do is we want to work together. If, if, if you've got a bill and you ask me to testify, I would absolutely do it. I've done it before. And I know when I testified for a conception bill probably 15 years ago, it was right to life opposing us on the other side. It's a travesty. People that make out their donation checks don't know it. But we've got to, We've just got to keep fighting. And All we've right. got to work together where we can. Janet, we got a break. Tom, we're back to you on the other side of the break. So, Tom, do you welcome Janet's help? Will you stand with Janet, or can you not do that in conscience? Back to Tom when we return. What exactly is dominion theology? 
Well, it's understood in a couple of different ways. And in the first way, I categorically reject it. The second way, I differ with it. In Genesis chapter 1, God gives this commission at creation. God blessed Adam, speaking of Adam, representing Adam and Eve. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And it is believed that this commission now makes its way into the New Testament with the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of the nations, and that it is the role of the church to take over, that it is the role of the church to take dominion over society, over government, over media, over entertainment, over education. It is the role of the church to take over. I reject that. I reject that theology. I do not find that in harmony with the preaching of the Bible or the teaching of the New Testament specifically. I reject dominion theology in that regard. I believe that we have spiritual dominion in Jesus over demonic powers. I believe in Jesus we have spiritual dominion over sin in our lives. But no, we do not take over the world. We usher in the return of Jesus through the preaching of the gospel, and he sets up his kingdom and rules and reigns. Now, there are others who are post-millennial, who have a different view, that they believe through the preaching of the gospel over a period of time that the world will then submit itself to the will of God and the whole world will become Christian. And then after that, Jesus returns. People like Jonathan Edwards and Charles Finney held to post-millennial theology. Jesus comes after the millennium. I don't hold to that view personally, but I would separate that from the dominionist aspect of we're going to take over. I find that type of teaching and emphasis dangerous and something to be avoided and contrary to the spirit of the New Testament. International speaker and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. If you want to find out more about Janet's position, about the effectiveness of the heartbeat bill, what's happened thus far, and even the question of the enemy within, Janet Porter, A Heartbeat Away. That's the name of the book. And Tom Heffling, uh, Tom, if, if folks want to find out about what you're doing, how they can get involved, what's the best place to go to, best website to go to? Well, the best place in terms of, of our work against uh, the abortion genocide is equal, equalprotectionforposterity.com. Uh, they can also go to selfgovernment.us as well. Okay, equalposterity.us. No, no, no. Go ahead. Equal. Yes. Say <laughs> yeah, it. It's a long URL. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Equal, equal protection for posterity dot com. Got it. All right. Equal protection for posterity dot com. So, yeah. so Tom, um, um, can you say, yes, I have a larger goal and I believe it's the only one that's righteous in God's sight. But if I can help Janet, I will. Or do you just feel that in conscience, that's a compromise for you? Look, I made a pledge uh, a number of years ago now that I would no longer support any legislation, any public policy that violates equal protection under the law, period. Her bill does not meet that test. Uh, I'll support any bill that meets the moral constitutional test. Otherwise, forget it. Uh, uh, we have to uh, begin to impose that plumb line on everything we do, and we have to st stop supporting politicians who violate that in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the church in this country has the power to stop abortion, but the only path to doing it is restoring our foundation of principle. Uh, and that principle is all wrapped up in, in those that phrase, equal protection for posterity. Got it. And Tom, do you feel that overturning Roe v. Wade will be enough to push back the abortion culture in America, or do you feel that that's just one piece in a much bigger puzzle? O overturning Roe is a canard. There is no such thing. Roe is not a law. Our courts are not empowered by our Constitution to make laws or veto laws. So there's nothing to overturn. It's an old, illicit, immoral court opinion that's 47 years old. Everybody who voted on it is dead and gone to meet their judge, okay? So there's nothing to overturn. We have to pass 
moral and, and constitutional legislation, and we have to stand by it. And if the courts don't like it, we need to tell the Supreme Court to go jump in the Potomac. Uh, on that equalprotectionforposterity.com website, right at the very top in the middle, uh, you'll see a, a, a link about judicial supremacy and why it's, uh, we're not supposed to be following illicit uh, unconstitutional edicts of courts. That's not the sort of government that our forefathers gave to us. All right. Then one other question before I go back to Janet. Uh, Tom, uh, why do you feel that those on the left are so hysterical about the possibility of, of overturning Roe v. Wade, uh, so worried that it's going to happen if, in your judgment, it's, oh. it really doesn't matter? Oh, I, you know, they're as ignorant as anybody, and, and they think that that canard means something, but it really doesn't. Uh, we need to stop even thinking that way. We need to stop uh, making our political and governmental actions conform to this whole idea that we live in a judicial oligarchy instead of a representative republic that is premised on the moral law. All right, so we have to, in a, I... a larger level, then just fight the judicial activism that we're facing. Yeah, Janet, please, your response. Go ahead. You know, I, I just want to say I really very much agree with much of what Tom is saying in that, yeah, you've got, you've got judges that are acting as legislators. They're out of control. Um, in fact, uh, I work with my, my uh, mentor, the late Phyllis Schlafly. We introduced a bill that was uh, to restrain the judges. We had to restrain the judges' bill. The Congressman Steve King introduced. Uh, he's no longer going to be in Congress because National Right to Life opposed this man, who's been a champion of marriage, a champion of life, and, and the sponsor of the heartbeat bill. It's appalling. Look, I, I agree. The bottom line is, how many lives have you saved? I, I, you can be pure, or you can be effective. And and I think that what we can do is we can we can get as close as as, as we can to our goal, but not not throw rocks at everybody who falls short of, of purity. I mean, Roe should not be treated as the law of the land, but the fact of the matter is, sadly, there isn't an authoritative figure. The president has not told judges to jump in the Potomac as much as I would have liked that to happen. Um, what we've got to do is, is, is protect as many as we can. And, you know, when I first we first introduced this heartbeat bill back in 2011, one of the things, there was an article that really stunned me, and, and, and it said that the pro-aborts fear the heartbeat bill more than they fear the personhood, the abolitionist approach. Why? Well, I remember when I was a part of, of protecting babies, trying to protect babies on the ballot in South Dakota from conception, what they would do in the last the last weeks of the campaign, they'd bring in all the blood money and they'd run commercials about woman, women in back alleys and that they were a glob of cells. That takes away the best arguments. What we're doing with the heartbeat bill is we're not talking about a single cell or a glob of cells in people's minds. Uh, which is also a human being made in the image of God. I'm not discounting that. But in the minds of, of many, that doesn't matter. But what we're saying is, look, in this case, we've got a fellow human being with a beating heart. And you know what the Barna poll showed? I mean, I've been in this movement. You know, Tom, I've been in this movement for, for decades, for, for more than 40 years. And what I found is that there's never, in my opinion, been a bill that protects this many babies. You, you know, every child is heartbeat can be heard and, and has this much public support. We found from a George Barna scientific poll that, that 7 out of 10 in America believe that if a doctor can detect the heartbeat of an unborn baby, that baby should be legally protected. 86% of Republicans, and here's the shocker, 55% of Democrats, yes, a majority of Democrats say, listen, I agree with the heartbeat bill because I'm not cold and heartless. I understand if there's a heartbeat, there's life. Everybody gets that. You know, we've never been to a funeral of, of somebody with a beating heart, you know, and the pro aborts got up and they said the heartbeat's not a sign of life. I just said, listen, you know, start start ripping down those hot heart monitors in hospitals and see what they do to you because they're not there for decoration. Everybody gets it. It's the heartbeat universally recognized indicator of life. It's not the, it's not the, it, the end game, but it gets us inches from our goal, and when that happens, even if we don't get a conception bill, what if we had a, 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 a just the, the presence of a heartbeat? That would get every child because that heart is beating at 18 to 21 days before the woman even knows she's pregnant. And so I'm saying, Tom, if you think you have a better approach, I say do it. Uh, do it. But, okay. but don't discount well, well, those that are trying something else. All right. So thank you. Bad. Thank you, Janet. Tom, uh, go ahead. You get the last word in. 
Okay, well, I've been around for a long time, too, and I've watched the, the, the pro board. They're not afraid of heartbeat bills. They're not afraid of any regulatory bills. They know the Supreme Court has set an undue burden standard, and they know that none of these regulatory bills even challenge that. They don't even challenge the basis for Roe v. Wade, which is, is, is the child indeed a human being made in the image and likeness of God, and therefore do they have to be protected by our Constitution's equal protection requirement. So, so Tom, again, the path forward in your view is to get what kind of bills passed? Is this state by state? How does this happen? Uh, abolition bills. You go straight to the murder code. You uh, define the child from their creation as a human being. Uh, you put them right with every other human being in terms of the murder code. And then you go through and you scrub out the decades worth of pro-life statutes that are on the books that in effect end with, and then you can kill the baby, get rid of those. And then you will have cured your legislative and your, your code book problem. It doesn't solve your judicial problem. And it doesn't solve the problem that you still need chief executives who will actually keep their oath to provide equal protection under the law and shut down these killing mills. And, and, and Tom. But here's the danger. Yeah, yeah. If you pass a bill like that that strikes down every pro-life law that a state has passed and says we're going to just we're just going to make it murder, then what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to pass that and they're going to strike down the the murder part and they're going to also uphold the part that strikes down every other pro-life law. There's a big danger because you run the risk but, of losing but, everything we've ever done. Go ahead, Tom. You're missing you're missing the other part of what I'm saying is you have to ignore that. We have to have pro-lifers have had massive control in this country politically for decades, both federally and, and major, uh, a vast majority of the states. Just start protecting the babies as their, uh, God and our Constitution require. Forget the court. And, and, and Tom, just, right just, just a question strategically, as we just have about a minute left. Janet said that Americans will recognize a beating heart, protect that baby. Do you think, because we're talking about voting for people who are now going to who are now going to rule on these things or cast their votes in state legislatures and things like that. Do you think that America is at a point where the hearts are turned sufficiently that they'll recognize the importance of a bill like this and go for it? The, the answer is no. We're not even at a point where a vast majority of the Christians mm -hmm. will stop compromising with evil. So we're not even at step A, which is to get the Christians to return. Got it. So if you're not at step A, all right. Well, let's if we if we can't get to the finish line, you know, at, at a mil, you know zero to sixty, why don't we why don't we take steps to get there? And if, if incremental bills are insufficient, let's look at the heartbeat bill because it's it's the biggest incremental bill there is. And and where we're looking at right now, we can't lose sight of, of what's what's most important at this moment. You can throw up your hands and say, yeah, woe is me, and the the world is is doomed. I I say this: that God has given us a chance at mercy that he's given us a man who says, I believe in the right to life. I will sign bills, and I will appoint judges that, will, that, that are right, do right by children. And with that, Versus yeah, with that. Harris, bloodthirsty, pro-abort, till birth uh, uh, opposition. Yeah, we Janet both, and Tom, I'm so sorry, but we are out of time. I appreciate you both joining me. Friends, go back, watch this, listen to this, evaluate the arguments. Let's stand for life.